Hello and welcome to the Siwi Sofa, where we sit down with some of the most interesting participants at the World Water Week to learn more about the array of water-related issues being discussed this week in Stockholm. My name is Eric Paglia, host of the Siwi Sofa, and the name of this session is Harnessing New Data to Unleash Sustainable Growth. And uh, with me, we have three uh, representatives of three organizations that are part of the World Resources Aqueduct Alliance. We have Shannon Quinn, Global Water Stewardship Leader at Procter & Gamble. We have uh, Charles Iceland, World Resources Institute's uh, Aqueduct Program. And Besma Murad from the Skoll Global Threats Fund. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Welcome. Very nice to have you here on the uh, sofa. And perhaps we can start by uh, having each of you um, uh, discuss uh, your organization and why you consider water stewardship uh, so important to, to make it a priority at your organizations. Okay. Shannon. Sure. So Procter & Gamble is one of the world's most experienced consumer products companies. We started as a small uh, soap and candle company in 1837, and since then we've grown to reach nearly 5 billion consumers in 180 different countries and regions in the world. Um, we have products like Ariel uh, laundry detergent, fairy dishwash liquid, and uh, Pampers diapers, just to name a few. And water stewardship for us, uh, just looking at the, at the water situation in the world, we really see it as an obligation to not only reduce the amount of water that we use in manufacturing, but also to uh, help provide clean water to those who need it most, and also to uh, allow people to have products that create uh, the ability for them to use less water in their home. Uh, my name's Charles Iceland. Uh, I direct the Aqueduct Project at, at the World Resources Institute. Uh, WRI is an, a global environmental think tank. We were established in 1982, almost 35 years ago, uh, to work at the intersection of environment and development. So we want to make sure that uh, the world's uh, resources, natural resources, are preserved, but also available for human use. Um, I founded the Aqueduct Program about seven years ago, and uh, the w water has become an increasingly uh, important topic to address because more and more we're seeing in the populated areas of the earth um, too much demand relative to the available supply of water. So um, we, we've seen uh, different users of water come, come up against each other as they compete for, for scarce resources. Uh, we've seen uh, negative impacts on the environment and so we are trying to help uh, those uh, uh, people who live in water stress basins uh, to better manage their water resources. Great. Uh, and Skoll Global Threats Fund is a private foundation founded by a gentleman named Jeff Skoll. He was the first president of eBay. And we were given the mandate to work on five global threats all that he believed required collective thinking and innovative approaches to try and address. And these threats are water security, climate change, pandemics, nuclear proliferation, and the Middle East conflict. All very large and challenging um, uh, issues. Um, and across our organization, we value partnering with different organizations and different sectors to try and really further um, approach and address these, these issues. And for water, it's one of the most complex and wicked challenges of our time. Uh, and I don't need to tell anyone here the importance of water um, uh, and its value to all sort of human assets. But also, we've got these macro trends at play with globalization and um, climate change that are making the challenges that we face from water risks, both the direct and indirect, all the more um, challenging. You three really represent very different kinds of organizations, but uh, it's fascinating to see you all come together under the, uh, under the auspices of this uh, World Resources Aqueduct Alliance. Looking forward to a very uh, interesting discussion here today. Um, perhaps, Shannon, um, can you tell us more about uh, the, the uh, approach at um, P&G in terms of water in the context of sustainable growth? Sure, I'd be happy to. So uh, water st our water stewardship program really focuses on three areas where we feel like we can have the most impact and the most immediate impact. So the first is reducing our uh, water use and manufacturing. The second is uh, providing access to our consumers um, with um, uh, 
water efficient products. And the third is providing clean drinking water to those who need it most. And so in order for us to really drive action around each of those three areas, uh, we have three specific goals. Um, and so the first one is to reduce manufacturing weight or reduce manufacturing water use by 20% per unit of production with a really specific focus on those areas located in water stress locations, those sites located in water stress locations. Um, and so far we've actually exceeded our goal. Um, we have got a 20% reduction um, of water use uh, since 2010 um, in all of our manufacturing sites. And we've promised to continue to con uh, really focus on those water stressed areas where we have sites. The second goal is to provide 1 billion people with access to water efficient products by 2020. So far we've uh, provided 450 million people with water efficient products like Cascade Platinum in the United States, which works so well that you don't have to pre-rinse before you put it in the dishwasher. Um, and then uh, our third goal really focuses on providing 15 billion liters of clean water to those who need it most around the world by 2020. And um, we've done a great job uh, with the help of our partners to provide 10 uh, billion liters of clean drinking water to those who need it most already this past spring. So um, those are those are really the three core areas that we focus on and, and we rely on partners to help us um, reach those goals. I'll put this next question out to, uh, to all three of you perhaps. Um, uh, oftentimes when you look at the water issues, you we talk in a very global sense, um, but um, why not... Um, why not look at global? I mean, is the global uh, outlook more important than the local, or which do you prefer in terms of local or global water addressing on a local or global issue? Um, well, uh, the, the reason water is, you need to look at it locally is because um, wa water is supplied at a local level, uh, you know, through the, the hydrological cycle. And uh, you can, you know, the, the, the main thing you want to investigate is, is how much demand there is in a particular location relative to the supply. Um, it would make no sense to worry about um, water stress issues in a basin that uh, where there, there's really little uh, demand relative to the supply. Um, so we, we, we try to depict uh, water risk worldwide um, at 100 kilometer uh, or 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer level um, and uh, try to help the, the people in those basins uh, better manage those resources. Yeah, I think we, we also agree. It, it's really a, a local issue. I mean, we, there's different things going on, especially if you think about our manufacturing sites. Each site is different and has different challenges, especially around uh, water. And, um, and so we really believe that it's a local issue with uh, global consequences. So, um, yeah, we would agree with the local focus. Maybe I'll add to that. Um, I mean, water is inherently local or basin level. So identifying the challenges and uh, identifying the solutions must happen at that level. But in our current day where the globe is so much more interconnected than we've ever been, we also are now seeing where a flood in one region or a drought in one region might have impacts beyond that area through supply chains and otherwise. So I think it's both. I think it's the local and global are, are necessary. I mean, how do you contain these risks? I mean, as you mentioned, these local, uh, a local drought or something could have uh, implications throughout your supply chains and, and markets and such. I mean, how do you, how do you sort of draw a, create like a firewall between the local level and global impacts. Do you think on that level at your organizations or companies? Yeah, I think uh, one of the reasons we started working with the World Resource Institute and the Aqueduct Program is because they allow us to really use data to understand what's happening at the local level, but then piece that together on a global scale to see where our hotspots are and where we should be concerned with and maybe where we should focus on in the future. Yeah, you do see examples of spillover effects. Uh, for example, uh, uh, between 2006 and 2011 in Syria, they experienced the worst drought on record. Uh, we believe, and others have, have published uh, papers showing that there were uh, a lot of farmers in Syria who had to give up farming and, and move to peri-urban areas of S Syria's cities. 
and that that led to a lot of the later unrest that that began the civil war we've seen and then of course that has had spillover effects in terms of the the migration out migration of syrian refugees into europe so so there is no real firewall that that's why it's in europe's interest in the united states interest to to try to help uh, developing countries like syria like countries in Africa or in Latin America uh, deal with uh, high levels of water stress and periodic droughts that they, they encounter. Yeah, and I think that there's been increasing efforts to sort of harness these new sets of data and new analytics that we now have to try and understand what those connections are in order to then get ahead of and prevent those risks. Not necessarily creating a firewall, but trying to work towards that, I'd say. And data is one of the, uh, the themes of this session here. Perhaps you uh, each talk more about how each of your organizations use data to, um, to improve uh, both your, your water use efficiency and, and in minimizing these uh, risks we're talking about. Uh, well, we, uh, uh, WRI's role is, uh, in this project is to collect the best data available uh, that, that's put out by uh, primary research organizations such as Utrecht University, um, the, uh, NASA, uh, other providers of the data. So we, we take those data, we, we create uh, risk maps that show uh, surface water stress, groundwater stress, flood risk, drought risk, how often droughts have occurred in history uh, in any given location. So, so where the uh, data purveyors uh, uh, providing these data in easy to understand ways so, so that the end user ca can can leverage it to make decisions whether they be a uh, business person or an investor or uh, a government official uh, each of these types of audiences needs to better understand what a risk and, and know how to respond to these risks yeah and, and I mean talking about bringing all that data get together and making it easy for the end user. I think, again, partnering with the Aqueduct Alliance and, and using the knowledge that WRI has, we've really been able to use th that data to help us make really effective and efficient um, assessment processes to in order to understand what's happening at the local level. And um, every time new data comes out, we're able to make that even more robust and create action plans that are even more meaningful. Sure. And just to add, um, as a philanthropy, we're not uh, developing our own sets of tools, but supporting others that are in a more capable position to, to do just that. Um, and I think one thing that we've been increasingly looking at is how can we sort of utilize these new sources of data that we have from a new sort of analytical capacities that we have from high resolution imagery to machine learning and complex modeling to really try and understand um, uh, risks around water and climate. Um, and we've been working and I think really valuing the relationship with uh, WRI and Aqueduct because it's also, they're able to identify where there's information gaps. One of the projects that we have underway with them um, that'll be forthcoming is looking at the relationship between water security and food, looking at historic trends and trying to project out longer term consumption, um, production, trade, to really be able to understand where changes are happening, where overuse does pose, water overuse poses challenges in the future. Perhaps we can talk a bit more about the Aqueduct Alliance, uh, how it works, a little bit of its history, and um, and Charlie, perhaps you can say um, how um, different organizations are partnering with WRI and whether it's uh, really making a, a tangible difference. Sure. Well, the the Aqueduct Alliance is, is a group of multinational companies, uh, investors, philanthropies, uh, and and government participants as well that uh, have come together to uh, uh, co-develop these uh, these data sets uh, that, that look at uh, the variety of water risks out there. Um, we, we've worked with uh, many different types of audiences with, uh, for example, with, with Shannon at P&G. Uh, we've 
helped her understand, you know, better understand uh, how risks vary from location to location and what risks to look at in each location, you know, given what the data is showing us. And, and they are then able to prioritize uh, which plants uh, are in trouble uh, due to yeah, uh, any given ri risk factor. Uh, we work with investors, so, so Bloomberg uh, has a terminal that uh, about 320,000 users use, ma mainly in the finance sector, uh, to assess uh, corporate risks and, and, and determine what proper value of, of company stock should be. And uh, we, with Bloomberg, uh, partnered to to put the water to, to put the aqueduct data onto the Bloomberg terminal and reach these these uh, uh, potential users in the investment sector. Um, we've also worked with a lot of uh, users in academia or in other types of research organizations to further their understanding of water risk and, and how, per, for example, it, it might affect um, relations between India and Pakistan who, who share the Indus River Basin uh, or uh, how um, water risk might uh, propagate uh, global threats through uh, glo you know, global trade and food and, and what can happen to that trade if it's interrupted due to droughts uh, occurring in major bread baskets around the world. Would you like to say any of your, um, your reflections on uh, your experience on working in the water on this uh, aqueduct alliance? Sure. I, I mean, I guess it, I think it's becoming more and more accepted that the water as an, as an issue and as a global challenge is not a single industry or a single government's responsibility. It's really got to be a multi-stakeholder investment and a collective action in order to, to really address these challenges. So what I like about the Aqueduct Alliance is that it brings together other industries, other actors, governments, and uh, twice a year we actually get together in person and we learn from each other. We have updates on what each of our organizations are really focusing on. Um, the Aqueduct team gives us an update on what they're focused on. They listen to us about what our perspectives are and, and so um, we're able to walk away from those meetings and from other interactions with them with with new knowledge about data, new knowledge about what people are doing in different water basins, and um, really important data that helps us better understand the future. Ditto to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think I have anything to add. I mean, is any of this data, is, it, um, is any of it considered sensitive uh, when it comes to different uh, international relations, or perhaps uh, proprietary when it comes to multinational companies, or is there complete transparency and data sharing within this alliance? Well, well the, the data that goes into the Aqueduct tool is, is all in the public domain, and it's offered for free. Uh, anybody can come to our website, they can use the tool, they can download the data behind the tool. So we're committed a, as uh, a, a uh, NGO and a think tank to make all this data uh, available to the public and completely transparent about the, the methods that we use to uh, develop the indicators. Um, at the same time, you know, w a lot of this data could be considered sensitive. Uh, there are lots of data that different countries' governments uh, don't want to put out in the public domain. So, for example, how much water is used in northern India, th that, that's something that uh, Indian government still tries to keep secret. Uh, what we do with our estimates of Indian water use in northern India is to, I guess, challenge governments like the Indian government or any other government for that exam, for that matter, uh, that wants to guard these secrets. We will say, well, th this is our best estimate of what your, your use is. And, and if, if you have a problem with this estimate, well, put your data out in the public domain and challenge it. Okay, perhaps you can, um, each of you say uh, a little bit about what your plans are for the next uh, five years or so in terms of, uh, of uh, using data and, um, and uh, your efforts towards sustainable growth in the water sector and uh, perhaps your, your work with the, uh, the uh, Aqueduct Alliance in the coming years. Sure, I guess I'll start. Uh, so I think we'll continue to focus on those three areas that I talked about. Um, 
manufacturing uh, will will continue to reduce across the board, but also really start to get um, get focused on those water stressed regions where we have sites and facilities. And I think Aqueduct will continue to be a really big part of that. Um, we have a three tiered water risk assessment that they helped us to, to develop along with the World uh, Wildlife Fund, and so we'll continue to use that and work through that. We have all of our sites identified, the ones that we want to prioritize. The next step is to really go in and learn more about what, what are they already doing to mitigate, um, what could they, uh, what opportunities are out there for them to mitigate. Um, and then the second will be to really focus on <laughs> ensuring that we have um, our one billion people with access to water efficient products. And we'll do that through uh, existing innovations, but also really try to inspire um, our research and development folks to create things that are, are new and um, exciting and help people save water. And we'll work to educate as well, because um, I think one of the big pieces is educating consumers on how it can help them save water and how much water they're actually even using in their home. Um, and so I think also with Aqueduct, we're exploring ways of helping uh, us to understand, you know, where are consumers located in those high stress uh, regions. And then the, the final thing will be um, to continue to focus on providing clean drinking water to those who need it most through our Children's Safe Drinking Water Program. And I guess the last thing is, is really partnering, I mean, continuing to partner with people looking for other, um, other actors who might be able to help us reach our goals uh, faster and, um, and coming together to, to really try to move towards sustainable development and help, help solve the water challenges, really. Well, we, we've done a, a lot over the past five years to document uh, different types of water risk. Uh, and, you know, we, we've rung the alarm bell. Uh, and I think we've, done, we've accomplished a lot of our preliminary goal, which is to make people aware of these risks. Over the next five years, uh, we'd like to really try to find uh, in the basins that are at risk uh, sets of solutions that are cost effective, that are socially and politically viable, and work with the community in each basin, the stakeholders. So that would include governments, uh, NGOs, uh, industries, and investors, uh, and any other stakeholders to, to try to uh, decide on an optimal set of interventions to bring water use back in, into uh, back to sustainable levels um, and uh, try to find ways to, to finance those, those uh, investments. Uh, you know, there, there's a, a lot of discussion these days, at least in U.S. Uh, political arena, on the deficit uh, in investment in our infrastructure. We see that uh, water resources is one of those areas where there's woefully low investment and uh, you know we we want to further the understanding that these investments should take place that they can lead to uh, economic growth that they can uh, uh, ensure um, safety of the environment and uh, the human right to water do you focus on any particular water basins or are you talking generally well, we, we've been working uh, in, in basins in China. Uh, we, we hope to, to launch uh, similar efforts in India and East Africa. So, so that would probably be the initial focus. Uh, uh, Asia probably has uh, a disproportionate amount of the water risk out there, there given the high population levels and, and the low le uh, investment levels in, in good water management. Uh, Africa is another continent that, that can expect to see its water risks increase and the number of people without access to, s to safe drinking water uh, increase over the coming decades. So, so we feel that those two geographies uh, should take precedence. Is access to data in those areas, is that um, where it should be at this point or is that also an issue trying to collect uh, accurate data there? Well, that, that's an interesting point, uh, and it allows me to introduce how the aqueduct data is created. We, we actually have global hydrological models that model supply uh, as well as uh, models that model demand. And so we, y because of that, we don't 
uh, need to rely on uh, on the ground data points uh, in every location. Uh, we, we use the on the ground data that we do have to make sure the models are accurate to fine tune the models. Uh, but all the data that you see in Aqueduct uh, are estimates, albeit ground truth, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the available data out there. Yes, well. yeah, um, I'd say increasingly we're seeing our work on water through the lens of managing climate risks as, as well as systemic risks as the impacts of climate change are most acutely being felt through water. And I'd say in the coming five years, we're going to continue supporting development of information platforms like Aqueduct, as well as adding new analyses like the Water and Food Security Analyzer. Um, we hope that this information will allow us to be able to identify areas most vulnerable to, to water and climate risks and identify how these risks have both indirect and direct impacts um, so that we can manage those most effectively. Uh, I think also, you know, we're at this unique time where we've got these big global frameworks that have been passed in the last year. So things like the SDGs um, and, and Sendai also allow for these information platforms to hopefully be used to sort of track, enable action on um, uh, reaching uh, the goals in, for example, the SDGs. And it, I'll just add one more thing, you know, I think partnerships throughout all of this remain highly valuable to us to be able to identify where there's areas of mutual benefit and interest across different sectors and across different scales is of critical importance as we further these efforts. Yeah, and I, I'd like to pick up on, uh, you mentioned the water and food security analyzer. Uh, we're very committed over the next five years to look at this water and food nexus. Um, many people don't know out, outside of the water world, but 80% uh, of the water we use is to irrigate agriculture. And uh, that, that's true whether you're in the United States or whether you're in China or whether you're in Africa. And so because so much of the water problem is wrapped up with our agricultural production, we're creating this new tool that cross-references uh, global water risks vis-a-vis uh, -vis the global food system. So we will, with, with help from an organization called IFPRI, uh, produce maps of global food production, food trade, and food consumption so we can better understand the dynamics uh, at work and the, the virtual flow of water through food, if you will. Uh, it'll, it'll shed light on a lot of our vulnerabilities, uh, not only locally, but globally, because uh, the, the, glo the, the food system is global. Um, and, and it will shed light on potential ways to, to insulate ourselves against those risks to build resilience. Okay, well, thank you all very much for joining us here on the uh, Seaweed Sofa, and wish you all the best with your continued work within the uh, Aqueduct Alliance. Thank you. Thank, thank you thanks, so much. Eric. And thanks for tuning in to the Seaweed Sofa today. Stay tuned for more episodes throughout the World Water Week.